I encountered this first wee, frozen tongue, a glue between jaw and skull proper, was stolen from the wolf carcass, road kill, left a thaw under a gloss black trash bag. The stink, muted by the downrush coal, I watched my instructor pull the bag back, saw the intact but dead animal, watched as the instructor's buoy knife slid through the knuckle-like bones of its neck, felt the serrations of it, watched the snicker jerk of blade, one quick motion. My instructor handed it to me, gloveless, defleshless, the frozen tongue, a glue between jaw and skull proper. There is no wolf, only wolves. Here, take this from me. I cradled the still cold rotting skull, no skulls, seven skulls for seven wolves, no goats to eat and countless skulls to deflesh. The tongue blue howled, no me only, countless me, stand there, cut this way, no me exponential. We dumped the bones into buckets full of bleach water behind the mass science building. The bones settled. Our flesh, its own sort of gift for strong-bellied scavengers, separated from those bones, became a murky sediment over our submerged heads. The cross beams of telephone lines drug me somnambulant through those days, until I too was left broken upon the road with no sense of smell. The threshold, M. The membrane must be contoured, I think, like the landscape left in our pillow when we remove our heads. The threshold, M. The membrane. The threshold, M. Must be contoured, I think. The threshold, M. Like the landscape. The threshold, M. Left in our pillow. The threshold, M. When the threshold, M. We remove our heads. In Van Gogh's wheat. In Van Gogh's wheat, they saw no prostitutes and no lower left ears to feed them. There were no workers there either. Where we threshed invisible, among the well-fed crowds in their Pasadena Paris best, a gray monochrome of scarves, berets, and boots in mid-June that collected cosmopolitan sweat. The patrons were attracted only to the vibrant impasto landscapes and ignored the mute portraits of the cracked dry, proud but exhausted workers, which gathered only cursory glances in the gallery before they were dismissed. Where we sewed, you were unwelcome if you had not lain down in the broad central divider of Foothill Boulevard in the tall crabgrass, and watched the cars pass at noon with split-minded no understanding. You unwelcome, who have not given of your flesh for a place to stay the night, or for a bottle swallowed all amber, the sticky drought of turpentine that friendship was. Vincent drank, shoulders lit by the southern sun, then perched atop the soiled newsprint divan, all for the love of a mute Gauguin. Who rejected him? Who held him at a blade's distance as the thinner agent scour smeared every beautiful moment within him? Vincent, men despise when they are given what they want for free. They could not see the presence among the wheat that you gave them in exchange for their absence of affection or conscience. So why now do they crow so loudly of their fondness for only one period of your work? So why can't they see the people who feed and clothe them with their own lives? So why now do they get to reap of you, the absent dead, that they embrace so safely with a bystander's indifference? Triage of the Skull Triage of the Skull, a parable. 
Wound, this is my birthday. My hands understand. It is the cut that welcomes the crush when I hit a door with a hatchet. It is seeking out the joints with splinters to bone. First the sever, then the wave of shock up the forearm and down into the created, liberated space, pressing deeper into the wound. Marrow and sap splay hot from separation, the flattening effect of blunt force trauma. My patient now as open as this room. Transform before I plant my foot to withdraw this heavy head to swing again. An emergency room visit, one not uncommon for the domesticated rat, withdrawn from his wretched cage, a twenty dollar pet. But I'm warned it will be three hundred dollars just to start treatment with no assurance of success in the chill linoleum floor triage room. Then the vet, stern and wordless, drops the numb agent into Natsu's prolapsed eye. He erupts. Natsu's, he, he cowers, a live bird heart in the hammock of my hand. As a father, I have one simple guide. If they must endure it, I must watch. Later, we are just thankful he is safe, he is home. Outside our kitchen, the oak limb reaches inside her window, groping at the smell of apple pie. She and I fight for days over what to do about the pebble-sized tumor growing on Natsu's mother foot. The left side of her chest sags. But it is operable, I yell. Three hundred dollars to start. She is two and a half years old. Maybe six months to go if she were healthy. But no one likes parables. By the time we are assured by science that she feels no pain from her affliction, the pebble has swollen to engulf her paw. Mama, I don't want these words. I want you to live. In the banana yellow kitchen, Otis croons, watching the tide roll away. I walk behind our house to the red plank woodshed, place my left forearm on the workbench, close one eye, align the hatchet head kiss with the knurled root of my right wrist. It takes more than one blow to get through. The pain of the doorway radiates from every new wound. It's funny how you understand. It's my birthday, you understand. It is the cut that welcomes the crush. When I hit a door with a hatchet, it is seeking the joint wood splinters to bone. First the sever, then the wave shock up the forearm and down into the created space. Marrow and sap splay hot from the separation, the flattening effect of blunt force trauma. My next patient now forcing its way into the room, transformed before I plant my foot to withdraw this heavy head to swing again, again. The threshold, M, is contoured, I think. Like the landscape left in our pillow, we speak across its threshold, a medium of skin, light, air, canvas, prism. Do we wish to transcend, escape through the jagged holes in our soul ceiling? Then why do we wait across the trash bag tide, a moonscape covered with our pillowcases well trod like the flesh of the dark side? Do we think we can escape by looking for the red door that leads to the attic of our first home? Why do we keep looking there? We are always in that attic, and the floor is made of curtains cut out of our own skin. Are we on the other side of the fold from this pain of now? Do we wish to transcend? We are already on the other side from now. Our perceptions gathered after the fact, the future defining what we see later, so slow to react. Is this what is outside of myself, and how do I reach then to you? With no now and no self is intent then the only membrane we can manipulate. The trash bags rise to the ceiling, we hold our breath and pinch our nose closed.
Assault on the Solar Plexus, Lee Krasner, 1961. On Brushwork This paint had always hunger looked at her as an object, hung taut between two scapula, but her work reversed this relationship. She taught the paint how to speak for her. Who owns you? Her knuckles curled, flashed out in a tight palm strike to the intersection between his ribs and lower lungs, forced his mouth open to jet the black arterial oil onto his wife-beaten shirt. He was no longer some casual observer, himself now a canvas of stretched late notices and blood spatter, as distinct a taste as vomited Melon Ball Boone's farm. What made her support his work? Shroud her own behind a black paper moon, in the eye of his orange-peeled barnyard studio, where he loomed over the object, flat on her back, a taut skin attacked with a stick, turkey baster, brush. The whip which never touched you leaves its mark, interweaved layers of the autonomic and auto-erotic, until the world lowered herself into his uneducated mouth. The Hamlet, the Skull. The desire of the school was to replicate itself in its endless variations through we, the alleged drivers, a transient flesh layered above and below its form. How often we were seen as an obstruction to it, how the skull sought to slip free of us. The desire of language was to replicate itself in endless variation in the forms of an absent heaven which sought out the evolutionary niche, the deeper adaptation to the real and not the divine, despite the hung howls of Plato and his obsolete plan for perfection. Chained to every tedious imbecile with hand or voice, how language sought to be free of us. But the closest route to their spawn pool of desire was through we, the flagellant writers, incompetent renderers of things for improbable skull, for improbable language. Woe to that simpleton who wielded the dome of good Yorick. Hamlet, who was it that resonated from your soon, too soon to be dead yourself, death mask? The skull you addressed was neither you nor your friend. The pair of you, two calcified actors, driven mad to impress themselves upon the soil about them. And we here, daily, accomplices of thingdom, lie to thrust past this threshold of self, this marrow bloom, piles of us buried between every village, every wilderness. If intent is the only membrane we can manipulate, is all identity performative? Are we like a sound wave, only expressed by dancing as a pair, one person invading the absence of the other through the tantalizing space they just left behind, daring us to enter? Do we move across all axes as binary waveforms that are perceived as amplitude trapped in the flat plane of our green-lit oscilloscopes? To speak, to center one's intentions, in a space unencumbered by stimuli, to trust apperception and accretion of self, to be before breath, before perception, before and after think, to listen, to trust in the apperception of another and acquire a together, a together to listen to. We form the ever-opening flower of the two-minded and two-spirited, to be a pair of scribbled black dots, each on a different side of our paper lot medium. Unable to see each other, we must believe we-ness into existence. The fact that we cannot see beyond the fold of a dimension does not mean that the unseen among the eleven do not also hold their sway over us. The mechanism of their influence telescoped within or expressed outside of us, either way, hidden. Does synchronization underlie empathy? 
are you and I the upper and lower rooms of the Baroque house as we trade stanzas, verses, and verses? The artery through which we transmit ourselves across the fold and through time space to each other hosts a game of peekaboo. Each time we blink, the fabric of perception has us leap across the asynchronicity, each of us a threshold of intention. Do we draw the lot? Is this dying together? The symmetry of our movements sim stimulates a sense of sameness, just as much as each asymmetrical expression reveals the reciprocal movement of two identities across the line of division, which also just suggests a juggling of sameness. Do we just miss each other between the folds in our blink? We, the missing skin that closes over the orbit of our shared, scooped out eye. The skull, the skull, we hermit crab, scuttled home. The skull, we, the skull hermit, the skull crab, the skull scuttled, the skull home. The skull, we crab home, the skull hermit scuttled. We, the skull, hermit the skull, crab the skull. Scuttled the skull, home the skull. Natsu, the domesticated hairless rex rat. They are in every way you can imagine kinder than humans. They groom each other reconcile after every fight. They honor their dead by eating them, and if you think this is uncivilized, consider that they then keep the fallen within them. That we weep for the passing of loved one does nothing for them. Their themness past such jagged concerns of the body, and on their deathbeds they push close to each other, as if to say to one another, this heavy head is too common for the domesticated rat. When the vet, stern and wordless, drops the numb agent into Natsu's prolapsed eye, he erupts, spraying blood from the inside-out optic muscle bundle, coating the pink furless rump, shoots his life along my forearm and beaded cheek. This is called an exculpation. Natsu cowers in my hand, he who has trusted me to keep him safe from the cold, mint green scrubs of the vet. Natsu doesn't understand anesthesia, which isn't for his pain but to keep him still. Natsu doesn't understand why the stranger is touching him. It's to keep him still. The anesthesia is to keep him still so that what is destroyed his eye will give no more pain or infect him as the vet scoops out that remaining eye. And much later, my wife and I will still laugh about our Franken pirate rat. We'll talk about fashionable eye patches. Still much later, we will imagine him as an infamous immortal. But we settle for the stitch scar from his left ear nearly to his nostril. For it's the gentle folds of his skin, so much like the jowl of someone's aged mother, that we welcome. We are just so happy he is home. Machine Felt obscene